this is my second year black. Um, last year was amazing. Uh, but I just, I was talking to care for this. It was just, it's wonderful how this is now virtual. So, so many people that couldn't maybe have attended before because it was in DC or Maryland that, that more people get to join the family. So I'm really excited to have everybody here. Thank you for making time to come hear me talk. Um, and so I'll just get started now. Um, the presentation I'm doing, as you already know, is on inclusive, purposeful and transformative park engagement. Um, so many of you may or may not know, I am a nature-based Oh God, programmer, healer. Like I, I say nature-based social worker, but I do not have a master's in social work. So I don't want to um, take a, a, a name I don't have, but I have been working in this field for about 30 years now. And um, so I think by just nature of experience, that's how I identify. And so that's the best way to sum up my work. Um, those of you who have seen me speak have seen this quote before. I live by this, this changed my, my thinking. Um, the person who loves their dream of community will destroy community but the person who loves those around them will create community. You know, this came to me years ago in Denver at a workshop. I had been working in environmental education for, I don't know, many years at that time. Maybe it was 2011 or 12. And um, I was vexed. <laughs> it was so much, oh God, I don't wanna say racism, but it was just so, it was just a um, tough place to be for someone who was thinking like I was because it didn't qualify as, traditional or accepted mainstream environmental education. But at that time I was in the process of, a, of, a, of an effort, leading an effort that was to kind of diversify the field and look into um, you know, specifically urban environmental education and building out that, that craft. And so I'm sitting in this meeting, you know, like oh, who are these people and they don't know about black, black people's problems and da, 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 you know, and I'm divided, right? And, um, but I read this and it, and it hit me because I said, you know what Akima, as much as you may not like this woman because she may not have treated you with the respect you felt like you deserved or because, you know, just that anger that brews in any part person that's aware of what's really, you know, going on. Um, it hit me though that everybody still has to be at this table, right? And it's about how I react to these things. And so I had to empower myself. This, this quote woke me up. And I think, you know, whether you know what you're doing or not, if you're just loving those around you, you're going to be doing the work. And so I know a lot of people that struggle and feel like, you know, because they're not black, they can't work with black people or black kids. And it's just like, no, who are you? You know, what's your heart about? You know, do you love those around you? And if you do that, I mean, that honestly, I just needed one slide today to tell you that, but <laughs> I did do more slides than that. Um, because, in, you know, in my 30 years, I started uh, back in two, 1991, um, Marta Cruz Kelly, Flip Haygood and Destry Jarvis opened the door for me. And I think Antonio Solorio is on the call too. Shout out. Uh, we were part of the uh, first crew of, pe of people, women and, women and people of color who were chosen to be in this career conservation development program. It was a program of the Student Conservation Association at the time. And you know, this was forward thinking on Marta Kelly's behalf because at that time, that means that she had to go out to these other agencies and ask them to take on a person of color um, for a summer internship which you know, a lot of those folks may or may not have been open to it, but thankfully she was able to secure, I think 20 positions. And, and we all went out to different locations within the National Park Service and Fish and Wildlife and all these agencies. And we had uh, experiences where we were being exposed to careers in conservation. And so I realized early on, I was sent out to Lake Mead National Recreation Area and um, there was urban out there, right? So um, part of the work was working at the visitor center, but they also had me connecting with the kids. And it was early on that I started to realize that, you know, it wasn't so much about the trees and the grass and the land as it was about the people. And I did get, you know, I became an environmental educator because I started to learn more about like the desert biome and, you know, longhorn uh, sheep. And I realized the difference between humidity and, you know, non-humidity, uh, 112 degree weather. And it was, a, again, life-changing experience for me, but it, it really solidified what I cared about. And from that point on, I kept trying to bring that to the forefront, but it didn't always fit because technically with environmental education, you're dealing with cognitive learning, like most cases, right? And this is based on knowledge and information. So you're judged, you're gauged based on what you know and what you, what you, what you, you know, recall and can say. Whereas the affective has to do with value and worth, right? And so when you're talking about working with stress, and so again, the most of my experience and what the only thing I can speak from is working with low-income African-American families in stressed communities. So in urban cities, um, you know, public housing, things of that nature, that's my lane. So that's all, I'm, when I say what I say, that's what I'm coming from. Um, but when you try to work with audiences of people that, you know, you're assuming that people are reading on their reading level. You're assuming that people can read, you know, you're making all these assumptions and then, you know, you're creating a line of 
you, it's just not inclusive when you when you look at things that way. If you're looking at an audience of people and you know your audience, right? You're supposed to know your audience that they aren't readers, but you keep trying to, you know. And as you know, nature experiences, nature education has so many opportunities for varieties of learning, right? And the multiple intelligences because you don't have to read to do environmental education, but the judge, the marker of success for that was always through an academic lens. And I, again, am not an academic. I'll put that disclaimer out there. It comes back down to this, right? You know, figuring out which section represents the best focus area of your work interest, right? So when you're trying to be um, inclusive, when you're trying to be purposeful, like what is your goal? If your ultimate goal is to collect knowledge from a group of stressed communities, you're gonna have some challenges. And, you're, and or you're gonna have to be really creative about how you put that information out there. But just as a human, you have to consider like how important is it that these kids can name these five snakes if they have to process, you know, death and, you know, not, and they're not safe, you know what I mean? And they're living, you know, seven or eight people in a two bedroom apartment, you know, so not that there's not a space for that and space for nature education, but I just really early on saw a way to make this, how to make this really, you know, inclusive, purposeful, which to me I've noticed has just led to transformative. So my current work now is um, I'm in Washington, D.C. I'm on contract with the National Park Foundation to um, help build a friends group for Anacostia Park. And this is wonderful for me because I'm from D.C. I played in Anacostia Park as a child. So this is really full circle. Um, when I got out of college and came back home, I did a lot of work around the Anacostia Park and on the Anacostia River. So, you know, I already eat, sleep and breathe this park. And if you're from D.C., you already know this park is amazing. Um, it's it's a really incredible space when you think about Washington, D.C. and the neighborhoods that are right along it. It's, it's truly a jewel. It's six plus miles of gorgeous Anacostia River waterfront. I mean, you take people up here, they forget they're in the city. I mean, and again, I'm preaching to the choir because I'm assuming everybody out here is in the nature choir. Um, it's 1,200 acres of parkland, so it's a fairly large park. Many of those acres are not accessible, but that's even better because that preserves green space and, and you know, nature along urban areas in D.C. and in, in the Ward 7A area. Um, it's the only national park that grows lotuses and water lilies. And again, if you have been to uh, Washington, D.C. and have not visited the Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens and are a nature lover, you, you should do this. I highly recommend that space. And shout out to the Friends of Kenilworth Aquatic Gardens. They do a lot of wonderful work to keep that park amazing. Um, and also, it's the only waterfront skating pavilion in a national park. And so that's pretty cool too, right? I mean, you get all kinds of people coming down. Some people are coming to fish. Some people are coming down the boat. But you got people coming down to skate. And that's pretty cool. So it opens it up and that park can be really inclusive and not just necessarily be about learning. And so to give you guys that are not from around here an idea of what's happening around the park. So if you look kind of to your left, I'm sorry, the right of that red little river, you know, that's the area, that red river, that red part is Anacostia River and the land mainly on this, the right side is, is Anacostia Park. Um, you'll notice that we also, you know, have this beautiful park, but also borderlines and pretty stressed communities. You know, the highest obesity rates in DC, the lowest median household income, and the highest level of childhood poverty. So if you have this, and we already know how transformative nature is, what, what could it mean for us to begin to start to come to this intersection of where we're considering the needs and, you know, strengths of the community through the lens of the park needs and the park's opportunities and assets? And obviously, you know, kind of it's unsaid that the majority of those communities are African American, unfortunately. And I just had to throw this in there because after saying all those negative stats, I just want to bring us back to this positive place. I love this family. Um, we do this a lot. We take portraits of um, families in nature. And it, I mean, look at that. Anyway, so um, part of my work has been um, one, one level of this was just kind of, you know, building on the relationships that the Park Service already had with some of the more traditional partners like the Anacostia Watershed Society, you know, the people that are doing that environmental work. But then also, what does it look like if we're thinking about the community's needs? What does it look like to begin to engage case managers or probation officers or social workers or mental health workers into Anacostia Park? And so one of the first things we did was um, organize a cohort, a meaningful engagement cohort because we're kind of embodying all this under the term meaningful engagement and um, you know we, we did this activity where we asked people and people maybe that knew me before this work I've done this sort of cross-section intersection before where you think of an environment as these challenges and powers and powers is typically assets but we asked the community you know what are some of the community challenges what are some of the park challenges and this is through the community's um, answers and the partners answers you know what are some of the community's powers and then what are some of the park's powers? And none of these are very surprising, right? You know, 
in the last 10 years, 12 years that I've been going to different cities doing this type of work where I'm pulling people together to kind of help them assess the, you know, connections look like and if you take crime, you use a bike walking path and consider issues around crime you know how do you do these things and so in doing that we built a network of people that included you know this is the non-traditional partner um, list so in addition to those environmental partners you know we've been partnering with the national council on behavioral health you know we needed to engage a network of trauma professionals and resources and, and the whole point of this was that you know i went to these people folks and asked them you know, if they could see how if the park experiences could fit anywhere in their continuum of care, because most social work based organizations function from a continuum of care that are like wraparound services. And so these folks all willingly came to the table, it was not pulling teeth at all. They either were personal residents of DC that loved Anacostia Park or just, you know, by nature of virtue and, and the stats and research on nature, you know, could see a way and could see a connection into the work. And so obviously, you know, identifying the concerns, and then logging some of the partner interests and then looking at, you know, what are some of the mental health? So this, this part at the bottom comes from the um, National Park Service is Healthy Parks, Healthy People and Parks Prescription Work. And so that's where they look at the lens of mental health, physical health, social well-being and spiritual health. I was so excited to see that the word spiritual health was in there because, again, that's another thing I kept in my pocket that was in my value system and how I worked with people. But you couldn't outwardly say in your outcomes like spiritual health. <laughs> it's just, you know, we're not there yet, but we're getting there. Um, but the park service is there, which is great to know. And so then the other flip side of this is if we're building this friends group, how do we also think about the needs of a park? So the same way the community has needs around crime, crime and violence, you know, the park service has needs around their basic um, divisions of resource management, park maintenance, visitor services, and then that philanthropic side of how do we begin to raise the capital to help with some of these um, issues around the park, specifically the, the infrastructure issues. And so, you know, we, we had this meaningful engagement series that we did, we co-led co and promoted, um, you know, cross promoted uh, people's events. You know, some folks were doing mental health work in the park without us, which was great. Um, but we also did connect and do some intentional things where maybe parents were working on their mental health while kids were skating and just, we got really, really creative. We had a, we still do maintain a really uh, diverse, robust network of partners who are excited about this work and um, are showing up. I mean, this was pre-COVID, so <laughs> there's we're still rediscovering what it looks like to show up in COVID worlds, uh, which has mainly been like pop-ups and virtual, but still the fact that these folks are still engaged, that we're still, you know, still at the table. These aren't people that was like a hit it and quit it. Like this is, this is we're dating, we're taking each other seriously. <laughs> and so one of the creative ways we engaged one of our partners was the National Reentry Network. We had these late skate nights where the park service extended their hours to 10 p.m., which was amazing because, you know, when it's warm, people love to stay in the park as long as they can. And you can grill in our park, so it's really a good time park. Um, but what we did was I worked with these partners and I said, okay, what's your outcome? Their outcome was to come and they had brochures and they had some really cool handouts, but I was like, mm, we need to do more because you got people skating and then you got brochures. Like it's going to be hard to tear people away from a cookout to come over here. We got to have something engaging. So what we did was we came up with this nature card activity where they made nature. Well, first of all, the national entry network sticks, you know, made the case for the power of nature just on their own as an organization and then asked people if they wanted to make nature greeting cards for people who were incarcerated because even somebody being incarcerated to receive a card could be just as beneficial i mean obviously ideal situation is to be out in it but for folks that don't have access just still the, the power of these pictures so folks made cards to donate and or you could take a card with you um, but they ended up having a lot of cards and this was something that they really enjoyed so they started doing this even when they popped up in other places doing other work. So now as they move forward, you know, they weave nature into to their, their engagement. And we also, you know, they also take families on the river now because they connected with the Anacostia Washington Society. But the other side of this was, we now have them as a partner that when we have an event, they come and they, this is what they do, this is their shtick. And it's really engaging and people like it and it's meaningful to them, right? It, they don't have to be testing water. They don't have to be you know, learning about snakes. They could just be doing something as simple as making a greeting card for someone who's incarcerated with a picture of nature. Um, and so this friends group, what does it mean to be a friend of the park? Cause that was another thing too, right? You know, most friends groups, um, and I say this loosely, 
and not with judgment, but they're fairly one-sided and focused on the park, which is understandable because that's what they were built to do, right? To support the park. But when you work in these stressed communities, right? And you've got people that are unemployed, um, you know, facing real life issues, it's hard to be like, hey, come out on a Saturday morning and pull trash or write us a $200 check. And I mean, you know, I know it's not necessarily all about that, but the bottom line is, you know, raising money, right? Or raising, um, well, we'll say for now, capital. And so with doing that, that allows us to open it up and consider the other forms of capital that people bring because these people love Anacostia Park. We've done this thing, maybe you've seen the t-shirts, but it's just, I love Anacostia Park. And immediate, the moment people take these shirts, they're showing, to me, I'm identifying them as a serious stakeholder. They have stake in this park, right? And so the idea of this friends group is gonna be where people can be members based on human capital, social capital, and or financial capital, right? And the way, and this is reciprocal to them is because it also helps them with the need, right? So you've got mental health, physical health, somebody that's trying to lose weight that comes down to the park and walks along the tour talking about the park is losing weight. They're, they're getting, they're, you know, they're getting steps in and people, I realize this. So these are real life quotes from people. You know, they get, they, this woman got off her diabetes medicine because she was, you know, started engaging in the park to help others. You know, people get to spend time with their kids and their families in the park. This stuff is trans. This this is transformative, right? Whether or not, and I'm not dismissing or dissing um, nature education, or the value of that. But that, you know, the first priority here is that affective side. How do people feel? Do they feel valued? Do they feel needed? You know, and and I, I've noticed from my experience, this is so. This this is what we're saying. We're looking at this model of how to address the park needs through the community's needs at the same time and formulate this sort of um, innovative uh, friends group model that can happen for other parks that are specifically near urban communities. Because you know, anytime you got a park that's being used by people that are stressed, you have to think like this, you have to think like this. And so we also, you know, another outcome of our work is we formulated an Anacostia Community Corps this past fall. Um, these are people from the community. They got a stipend to be trained, um, but we also flushed out their skills for them. You know, they're showing up like Miss Pearlie, who just graduated high school, you know, but, you know, realizing her worth, we, we, we value you. Not, not only do we, we're showing you we value by paying you, but we're also, you know, leaning on your 30 plus years of working with youth. You know, she advocates for neighborhood safety. What that really means is she lives in a stressful neighborhood and she stays on watch and protects kids from gun violence in her neighborhood. Like that's real stuff. You know, she doesn't have to have a PhD for me to respect her. I have the utmost respect for these people because they have these incredible expert, this incredible expertise that is extremely relevant in these communities. And, you know, we're showing, showing how and facilitating ways that that can show up in the park because a lot of our park users are from these stressed neighborhoods. And so game recognized game. These folks can, can better relate and they can even inform the park service, you know, moving forward. And, and, and we're even doing that type of skill share where we've blended now the, the, these um, core members with park, um, uh, park professionals like the park rangers and visitor services where they're training them in history, but these folks are giving them feedback and insight on community engagement. And these folks are also working with the resource management department to help them when they have to get community input on these really technical things like gear management plans and so forth. But it's working out guys, because these people do care. It's just putting it in a language that makes sense. And so when you look at your work and you wonder, you know, how, how it's showing up um, and how to be sort of inclusive. And again, what I haven't really referred to that I think everybody already knows is, is we're living in a high time of racial tension and the have and have nots. And, and at the bottom of this, you know, I'm gonna say it's not about race. I mean, in theory, obviously it is, but it comes down to economics. And if you haven't been low income and if you've never, you know, feared for your safety, it's hard to do this work without stopping and building empathy and considerations for these things, right? And, and again, it also comes down to why are you doing this work? Now, if you're doing this work for a check, there's a good chance it's not gonna be transformative. I mean, I understand people gotta work to work, but this is not for the lighthearted. This is not, you know, come in, wave by. This is this is this is meaningful work that takes investment on both sides. You know, and so these are some of the checkpoints that um, I wanted to share because over the course of my career, you know, this is what I'm checking myself on, Akeem. You know, do these residents have their basic needs met? Now, a lot of environmental groups will immediate, immediately say, "Well, we're not social workers." Hey, guess what? You can partner with people that do that work, right? Just as a consideration, put their brochure on your nature center countertop. You know, some way that you at least, again, recognize the consideration if these people are coming into your center and they're homeless, 
I mean, there's a way to deal with that. You can't just push them out, especially when you when you when you manage a space or you're running a space or representing a space that is supposed to be open for all. You have to consider that spectrum of all, um, and and partner with the right people that can help you. You know, it, you're not a social worker. You call somebody in, um, and, and again, especially like I mentioned now that there's a growing um, buzz around the environment and outdoors that even more um, social service partners are finding the connections and are interested in, in these innovative partnerships. Um, you know, so do these, and, I, and this says residents, cause I was talking from a community's perspective, but do they take on leadership roles? Are you sharing power? Like, do you, do you share the mic? That's really, really, really important. Um, that residents are agents uh, for community change. Um, that's a long deeper one. Um, residents are comfortable with working with data and information. Gosh, I need more time because I could go <laughs> deep on all of these. But if you just kind of take a take a look at these, and, and hopefully I'll be able to share this these slides. If not, you know, reach out to me and I can. But these could be some of the benchmarks that you work toward as you start to consider how to be um, transformative in stressed African American communities. Because again, that's that's where my 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 specialty is 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 those kind of communities. So, um, going back to the idea of what the the talk was, you know, so if you if you are inclusive. You know, helping people feel included. If your work is purposeful and you find a way for people to feel needed, you will. It will just happen. Your work will be transformative. It will just naturally be transformative and lead to change because people will be invested because they have to drive that change. Again, you can teach me about five snakes, but then what? Does that stop me from? I would never kick a snake, but does that stop somebody from harming a snake? You know, does that stop somebody from dropping trash on the ground because they realize that you know it's connecting to the habitat of the snake? No, but when it's when it's when you go through that a factor of feeling and values and you align with values and you love those around you, that's when it happens. That's when it happens. Wonderful. Um, we have some questions for you if you if you can um, take a few minutes. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, one of the questions is how do we encourage federal agencies or national organizations to adopt and or support use of models of grassroots work as you're demonstrating here? I would say find the courage <laughs> to have <laughs> conversations. I mean, this work is not easy. I would say there's a large body of work um, out there now, um, especially like uh, Marion Krasny has done a lot of work um, from out of Cornell University with the Civic Ecology Lab. I mean, sometimes those agencies need those factoids. They need that research. They need that. I mean, but but also, you also just need open-minded people. And there's also the reality that sometimes your organization isn't ready to do the work. So you're, the indicator may be you may need to work somewhere else. And I know that's easy to say and harder to do, but that's the reality, right? You can't control your bosses. You can't control those. I mean, you can try to influence them and again, find some of this information that's out there to present to them in a way that you can kind of compel them. But if they're not compelled off the break, just based off the stats of society and how messed up things are and the need for, uh, not division, but the need for us to get creative, um, it, they're probably not ready and they won't do it anyway. I understand. Uh, another question is how does this work and project connect with Promise Zone and SPARCC communities. Also, is there a connection to greenways and connected parks? Um, so what I'm pitching to you is really um, uh, a practice, like a way of practice. Where you apply it could be almost anywhere. It depends on you know what you're dealing with. So if you are trying to, um, you know, so when you said DCP on the first part, that sounded more social to me. So. Again, it's just getting the partners in the room, right? The people that represent these different entities, the people that represent the green side of this, which would be your rivers and your parks or whatever it is, the green space, and your social service folks on this side. And so the practice I'm saying is that when you bring those two people together and look at their continuum of care and or do the pre-work to say, hey, these people work with you know, mental health. Let me um, you know, open up the idea of working on using our path for some of their, their sessions with their clients or, you know, these folks need, their, you know, um, need to be engaged because they're just hanging out or they, you know, need hours with their families. Oh, great. You could be over here staffing this visitor center or physically helping us with labor. I'm really in this mindset now of looking at therapeutic stewardship on how 
like there's a like kind of with the Quad Gardens is across the street from a really stressed neighborhood. You know, I, I have this vision for how can we get these fellas trained up as volunteers to come over and work off some of their steam, to come over and just be in a safe space. Cause some some of those fellas in that group don't always want to be out there. You know, they would love to be somewhere else and need somewhere to be. So how can parks also be a safe haven and a spiritual workout space for people that are stressed? And I kind of probably went above and beyond that question, but yeah, no. that's what I heard. And that's sort of a good segue to another question from Brittany. Um, she asked, what are some essential steps you'd advise in building a community core? Well, um, why are you doing it would be the first question. Um, uh -huh. you know, am I doing it because we've got a trail that needs to be built? And are we doing it because we want to build relationships and help the local economy and workforce of people in a particular place, right? Um, because those are the different elements, right? So the thing I did, I realized with this core work is, you know, it's easy to come up with the Anacostia Park 101, 102, da da, but you have to also interweave in the spaces for, you know, who is this person? Uh, we do personality tests, which people think are fun, personality quizzes that tell them a little bit about themselves. Because, you know, the people that I'm engaging typically don't have, um, you know, college or um, technical training experience. And so helping to pull out their best so that they feel invested in it as well and not just a core member that's getting a check. I mean, you can always get by on that because people want money. But again, it depends on what are you trying to do. If you're trying to get this trail built, that's hit it and quit it works. But if you're trying to build economy in, a, in an organization or excuse me, in a neighborhood, or you're trying to build the, the social wealth of a community through engagement, or you're trying to build up, you know, people's work skills, then you're going to have to do a little, you know, invest in that a little longer. Um, and so it's not a real easy question to answer. Yeah. It is easy to answer, but it's, I, I feel like I need to give you information like, oh, let me share this. <laughs> yeah. Okay. The questions are really coming in now. Um, well, um, Richard wants to know, when developing a student internship for a park unit, what is the typical amount of time that a park employee should put into mentoring, training, instructing that student? Well, I would definitely hope that you have um, like uh, team building, person building, like time that you are quiet and listening to these youth, learning who these youth are, you know, maybe doing your pre-work around you know youth interests or something um, something that shows that you this is not just about what your outcome of you know your internship again whether you're building them to talk on a tour or whatever but just kind of getting to know them as people you know just um and i'm not saying to soften it up where you kind of are texting each other and bffs but you know just really approaching this from an empathetic pr perspective of what it is for them right because a lot of youth not just african-american youth but specifically, you know, any stressed youth, you know, they've got a lot going on and, and you could miss a cue somewhere and misread this person when all it could have taken was maybe just engaging in some icebreakers with them that are not technical, but more so affective where you get to kind of know who you are as people. That, that would be the basis. Then you come in with training and all that. Because if you don't have that relationship and it does, again, you don't have to be BFFs because this is a professional thing, but at least a mutual respect, a mutual of understanding that you both want to be there you know, that, that's, that to me is core to any core building. Or mm -hmm. There's a lot of interest um, and requests for you to share your slides. So um, we'll have to figure out how to do that or if, that, if, if you're willing to share the, um, your slides because people would like to, um, to, sh to use your information and to, and to listen to this presentation again, so. And folks know how to reach me? Can okay. you put it in the chat, Akima? Yeah, I'm in. Am I in the same chat? Is everybody panelists and attendees? Okay, there we go. And then also, I would encourage you guys, and I'll put this first, but to join the Urban EE Collective, because there are a lot of other people that know even more um, than I do about this work that you can find in this group that you can kind of pitch ideas out to or questions, and or you can specifically ask, and I can share it in there so more people can you know get it at one time. But as far as my slides. Akima at apriceconsulting.com. Spelled that right? Yep. There we go. Okay. Thank you so much, Akima. 
you brought gifts today for us and we are so grateful. The, the idea of people creating nature greeting cards for people who are incarcerated, I mean, that's priceless. It's just, just a beautiful way of demonstrating to people that they have wealth and they have value and, and, and the way that shows up is in what they can do for others. And I think that's the gift of everything that you've presented today. You demonstrated that all of us have value. And if we want to be a part of protecting nature in an authentic way, then we have to make sure that everybody can contribute. And, and, and you've you know, just really given us a course on how to make that happen. So thank you so much for that. And I just wanna to say to the question of time, because we're all always feeling pressured around time. Um, what you said, what I heard you say was that empathetic and authentic effort can collapse time. And that's just understanding that whenever you're engaging with other people, you are engaging in a relationship. So it doesn't matter if you have a week before a project is gonna kick off or a year. If you are not empathetic and if you are not putting in the work to nurture that relationship, then that project is going to suffer. So right. that's another gift that, that you have brought to this, to this conversation, uh, to the goals that we have for Taking Nature Black and, and the work that all of us should want to do as people who are working to protect the environment. So thank you again, Akima. We appreciate you. You always bring gifts and you have blessed us today. Okay. Thank you, Carolyn. Thank you everybody for attending. Have a great afternoon and we hope to see you tonight.